Welcome to our webinar, How Community Organizations and Small Businesses Can Work Together in Emergencies. My name is Sam Lawson. I am a Community Engagement Specialist at New York City Emergency Management. And I will let my co-presenter introduce herself. Hi, everyone. I'm Erica Amaya with New York City Emergency Management. I'm sure you can hear my dog, Charlie, in the background. <laughs> uh, I work with the Strategic Partnerships Unit, and uh, I'm so thrilled to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation, Sam. Great. Thanks, Erica. And we will have, um, we'll introduce our guest speakers um, later on before we, after we do the introduction. But we're really excited to be doing this topic today because this is the first time we've introduced this topic, which is how organizations and small businesses can work together in emergencies. It's something we, um, it's something we get a lot from our partners, which is how can I work with businesses in my neighborhood? Um, and we are really excited to make that first step in introducing it. This is a part of our National Preparedness Month webinar series. Later on in our program, we'll talk about how you can get connected to our other presentations. You can um, type in the chat if you have any questions. And at the end, we'll talk um, again about other webinars, but this one will be recorded and sent out. We'll have a small group today, so we would encourage you to present um, Okay, it looks like we have him on. So we're all set to go. So first, who are we and what we do? So I know most of you, um, I recognize your name, so I know that you're familiar with our organization, but New York City Emergency Management helps New Yorkers before, during, and after emergencies through preparedness, education, and response. What this means, is that every day we um, are one, go out and help people get prepared for an emergency. That's what Erica and I do every day. And at the point of this webinar, of course. And then when something happens, for example, flooding or hurricane, we respond and help communities to recover. We are, today we are focused um, Today, we're, this is presented by the Community Preparedness Program and Partners in Preparedness, which Erica is going to talk about. But before we go farther, I want to show a video just talking about our program. This is a new video we have for National Preparedness Month. And so I'm going to share my other screen. And Erica, give me a thumbs up if you can hear it once I start playing it. Will do. New York City faces a range of emergencies, from severe weather to fires to power outages and much more. If your community organization or network isn't prepared, it's hard to respond calmly and effectively. That means you might not be able to continue serving your community when they need you the most. But with a plan in place, your community network has a much better chance of being able to help others. New York City Emergency Management's Community Preparedness Program offers local community and faith-based networks and organizations the tools they need to prepare for, respond to, and recover from emergencies. Learn what you need to have in place before an emergency. You can find out how to identify local resources to create a community resource directory and show your community members where to go for specific services or assistance. The program also offers a framework for coordinating volunteers and creating an emergency communication plan to help you stay connected with your community. The program also provides a blueprint for what to do after an emergency. You can learn how to prioritize resources and services and the best ways to manage volunteers and donations. 
This ensures you don't get overwhelmed by resources you can't use and get enough of what you need. Emergencies happen. But having a plan means your organization can continue to be of service even during the tough times. So sign up with the Community Preparedness Program today and let New York City Emergency Management help you organize your community network as you help others. So that video was to show the Community Preparedness Program. And basically our goal is to make communities more resilient by um, showing organizations how they can connect with one another to build support. And we're gonna see a real life example of that today. One thing I also forgot to mention is that New York City Emergency Management is actively responding to an emergency right now, of course. Um, the flooding from Ida in the chat um, Erica shared the link to our resources page. Thank you. And there you can see what resources the city's offering. Currently, we have service centers open in um, the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. And we encourage everyone to visit that site to see what resources are being offered there. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Erica to talk about our um, business programs. Hi everyone, as I mentioned before, my name is Erica Amaya and I'm a coordinator with the Strategic Partnerships Unit at Emergency Management. Uh, our program, Partners in Preparedness, was established 10 years ago in 2011 and it's nationally recognized uh, program that supports you in preparing employees, services, and facilities for emergencies. Uh, as Sam mentioned, uh, we're currently responding to an emergency right now, the post-storm flooding caused by uh, Tropical Storm Ida. And, uh, you know, we've all been responding uh, at least in some capacity since uh, early 2020 to COVID-19. So we all know that disasters don't, uh, you know, end before another one starts. They run concurrently and uh, preparedness is a, is a really huge piece of making sure that our communities, our organizations, and our businesses can open their doors back up uh, after there's a disaster. So our program uh, is for all industries, whether you're a nonprofit, whether you're a small business, whether you're a multinational corporation, um, it's, it's completely free and we've got tabletop exercise toolkits uh, so that you could play out some scenarios. Uh, they're ready to plug and play for your organization. And um, we also have past webinars recorded and available on our partner portal. I know this webinar is being recorded. I'm sure we'll post it there. Uh, and Sam is going to send it out afterwards. Uh, I know that a number of folks weren't able to attend in person because of all the things that are happening within their communities. So uh, we just wanna make sure that it's available um, for those folks to watch after the fact. Um, but yeah, I think we're ready to talk about what uh, what bids are, what co-ads are, and how the two can come together to form a more resilient community. Sam, you want to start with co-ad and I can dive in with uh, bids? Yeah, thanks, Erica. So we wanted to get everyone familiar with um, two types of organizations that you will come across in New York City when it comes to emergencies. So. First, community organizations active in disasters. We also in our agency call them community emergency networks. So this is a group of community organizations, businesses, nonprofits, and individuals working together to plan community responses to a variety of emergency and disaster situation. What that means is that in various parts of the city, for example, the Lower East Side or East Harlem, Southern Brooklyn, there are 
community organizations that have umbrella organizations that work on emergency preparedness and response, and those are called COADs. We also see other types of organizations that are these umbrella organizations working on emergency, um, emergency preparedness and response. And we encourage everyone to get linked so that when something happens, you know who to reach out to. And that is the purpose of a co-ed or other organization. If your neighborhood doesn't have one, don't worry, because any sort of connection that you make with other organizations will serve the same function of getting um, people prepared um, through connection. And I like to think as of bids as the complement to those community organizations. Um, you know, if you know, uh, or if you already work with a, with a bid, we would love to hear from you, uh, what your organization is and what bid you work with. Um, do you know who your local bid is? If not, we'll share a resource so you can look them up and get connected. Um, you can type in your comments and questions into the chat um, and we would love to hear from you. Um, but bids help to uh, brand their districts and um, they facilitate networking among merchants or small businesses. They can host community events, you know, lots of um, community. Ooh. Oh, that's Sam. I was like, oh, we already got a, a response. Um, they host community events, advocate for improvements to their district. And they also serve as a liaison between local businesses, stakeholders, and city government. Um, and so bids provide a collective voice for the neighborhood and help inform city policies based on their unique local knowledge. Um, so I envision that community organizations are informing that uh, community knowledge and that those that um, stakeholder communication definitely goes both ways and each bid is run by a non-for-profit organization with the board of directors i think it's important for us to understand how bids work um, so that you you know you, you have that background and understanding where they're coming from um, they're elected by members in the district, and the board must include property owners, merchants, residents, and representatives of uh, local elected office. So it's possible that you might belong to the board of directors for your bid, or you might become interested in getting more involved with that. The board is in charge of making key decisions about programs and services, budget, our favorite things, uh, goals, policies, and staffing. And bid programs and services are funded by a special assessment billed to property owners within a district. So they're really not the same. It's really, um, it's not one size fits all. It's very specific to the area and neighborhood. And as, as I mentioned, assessments are unique to each bid and decided upon by the bid stakeholders. And the city of New York assists with the collection of the special assessment, which in turn is distributed directly to the bid. And then the bid receives 100% of the money collected. Um, and on average, these assessments make up 75% of the bid's budget. And most bids also fundraise, they apply for grants and generate revenue from programs to support the services that they might provide. Uh, New York City Small Business Services, or SBS as we'll be calling them throughout the rest of the presentation, provides oversight and support to the city's existing bids and to communities interested in creating new bids. Additionally, our staff, I'm sorry, SBS staff serve as board representatives for all the bids in New York City. You know, most days we are going through our daily routines. First day of school is yesterday. I know everyone's back in the office for the most part. Uh, emergency situations can quickly throw life into turmoil if we're not prepared. You know, here in NYC, weather emergencies like flooding and heat waves are regular occurrences, and that's just the summer. You know, no matter what the scale of the emergency, having a well prepared safety plan is key to getting through the event and getting back to normal routines. And by forming relationships with businesses or business improvement districts, we can take preparedness a step further to ensure community resilience. I think we're ready for the next slide. Great, thanks, Erica. And I do want to acknowledge we 
Um, thank you, Priscilla, for joining from a, uh, the Forest Avenue bid in Staten Island, who um, is discussing, you know, advocating for their members who were impacted by Ida. Um, and what Michelle offered, which is that Fifth Avenue committee works with local bids and co-eds in their district. So the next concept that we wanted to introduce before we get into the discussion is around community resilience. So especially for people who are on the business side, who might not be as familiar with the concept of community resilience. So one definition, this is from the RAND Corporation, if you're familiar, is that community resilience is a measure of the sustainability of the community to utilize available resources to respond to, withstand, and recover from adverse situations. And what this means is that community resilience is basically how well a community bounces back after something happens, like a shock, like a flood or a hurricane or something else like an economic downturn or uh, a virus. What we've noticed across New York City is that the more connected a neighborhood is, the more resilient it is. And this concept is called social capital. So how connected people are to each other is social capital. The more social capital or connection a community has, the better it responds to shocks and the better people recover so that they can um, get past whatever happened. We're encouraging in this webinar for businesses and small, um, you know, small businesses, big businesses, networks and organizations to get connected because we want to increase the resiliency of our New York City communities. And the way to do that is through that sort of connection that we're going to hear about. Um, and Erica, do you have anything to add to that on how you might think it might um, uh, relate to your partners? For sure. And I think this really goes across all, all stakeholders, whether they're a nonprofit or a business or a family unit, you know, key preparedness activities, whether it's your continuity of operations plan, if you have a, a reunification plan for your family, um, having a shelter in place kit or a go bag. Those are all essential basics that you have to do in order to have a, a more resilient community. You aren't going to be able to provide services or show up at your business or your uh, community organization if your own home, you know, was impacted and you don't have power or you don't have food or water. Um, so making sure that you're taking care of yourself, your business that will allow you to uh, take care of the community and work together in within those circumstances. Um, so I really, I know it's um, something that we repeat a lot, especially during National Preparedness Month, um, but that uh, those initial preparedness actions will help you build uh, resilience and add features like social connectedness or that social capital that Sam talked about, um, which will hopefully, I think over time, um, and what our goal is, improve everyday wellness and community systems. Thank you. Very well said, Erica. And with that, um, we're going to get into the discussion of this webinar. We have two great partners with us today. We have Michael Stamatis, the president of Red Hook Container Terminal, and Michelle De La Ouz, the executive director of Fifth Avenue Committee and Neighbors Helping Neighbors. So I think what, how we can start is just by hearing the story of how they responded to COVID-19 by working together. And I'd like to start with um, you, Michael, on how this initiative started. Before we do that, I'm so sorry. Can you share a little bit about your organizations for those of us who might not uh, be as familiar? Sorry to interrupt. Thank you so much, Erica. No problem. Uh, sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. So uh, Red Hook Container Terminal is a port facility located in the heart of Red Hook in the busy community here and uh, has been a facility that's been operating here continuously for probably more than 40 years. Uh, which was built in the 60s um, along the active Brooklyn waterfront. 
So we employ you know, uh, men and women that work here every day, loading and unloading ships, receiving and delivering cargo every day, and uh, are responsible for you know, uh, maintaining operations here uh, for vessels and barges and a number of other maritime related activity. And um, so I became president here about 10 years ago. Actually, we're hitting our 10 year anniversary in 2000. I started uh, right at the end of 2011 and um, in September of 2011. And, um, you know, wasn't, wasn't that all familiar with the Red Hook, uh, other than uh, I recently had started doing business here with the previous operator, bringing vessels that we we uh, we had coming into the uh, into the into the country from Ecuador, bringing bananas and other perishable commodities from <coughs> excuse me from Ecuador and distributing them around New York City and up and down the East Coast. So. Uh, shortly after I, I was a customer here, I was offered the job of president and decided to leave my old position after 26 years and take on this new challenge of becoming president of the uh, facility here. Um, and really, really happy that I did that. It's been a very a great decision. Uh, you know, my career has spanned 35 years working around New York Harbor in New Jersey and Staten Island and now uh, Brooklyn. Um, and one thing I recognized right away was that this was definitely a unique place in terms of our business. Uh, most port facilities are not located anymore in communities like this. They're usually built in areas away from communities because you need large expanses of land and access to the water and lots of room for storing cargo. So Red Hook is a unique facility in a community that really has welcomed the activity here for as long as I've been here and beyond. And, uh, you know, during the pandemic, when it started, you know, there was a lot of ha lot happening, a lot of certainly bad news every day and a lot of uncertainty. Uh, we were focused on keeping our workforce healthy and coming to work and dealing with reg new regulations and requirements of, of just being able to operate a facility as a part of the essential workforce here that was required to continue to operate to maintain food supply chains and and uh, and goods coming into the country and distribution so so we focused on that and our, and our you know workforce you know worked very well to continue to try to do everything we could to stay healthy and keep coming to work and one of my other sort of passions and businesses that I'm in is I'm I'm, I'm an importer of produce uh, mainly bananas I started my career in 1986, working for a banana company that was one of the largest distributors around the world from Ecuador. That's kind of how I got into this business. So my partners and I decided, hey, you know, uh, hearing what was happening with schools being closed and, you know, we, we wanted to do something to help the community that we work in and, and sort of I spend most of my time here now. Um, and as an importer of food, you know, things were happening in the marketplace with restaurants closing and and the market up in Hunts Point, not able to receive as much uh, goods right away. So we decided to take some product that we had coming in and donate it. And the picture you see on your screen is one of our employees holding a box of pineapples uh, that we decided to donate. And initially it was just gonna be, you know, we were gonna donate one load of pineapples and have it, try to get it distributed locally. And it was important for me not to, you know, I've done a lot of donations in the past with companies and organizations like City Harvest and other food banks. But I wanted this to really stay local as much as possible. So not having those local connections to figure out how to distribute uh, thousands of boxes of pineapples. Ultimately, I see a little note from Michelle, there's over 10,000 pineapples. We reached out to the Southwest Brooklyn Economic Development Corp, Mr. Ben Margolis and said, hey, and we reached out to a bunch of people too, uh, other elected officials and other folks that we knew. But Ben was instrumental in introducing us to Michelle and her group and her organization. And was that was really the key for us to help figure out how we can keep this product, these pineapples, and ultimately other uh, items that we decided to donate local. Uh, Michelle's team had her network of people that helped us figure out where 
this product could go, whether it was to the Red Hook houses or other, you know, community groups. And ultimately, we ended up donating not just pineapples, but other produce items, meat and, and beef, and, and uh, started receiving donations from some of our customers and our business relationships that we had in the city who were also in the food business. And ultimately, we ended up donating, I think it was somewhere around 2 million pounds of food, uh, which mostly went directly and distributed to the local community here in Red Hook, Red Hook Sunset Park. And we even end up sending some product to uh, some folks up in, up in the Bronx at some other uh, housing uh, projects. So it was terrific that we were able to do this. And we couldn't have done it without Michelle's group and, and their help. And some of the local, some of the other local community organizations, and you know this today is really important, uh, and, and the timing is is also uh, important because we're actually involved in another relief effort right now as we speak, uh, because of some of these connections that we now have and some of the local community groups that we're able to talk to. Uh, for example, we're now working on a Haitian relief effort, and we're sending contain empty shipping containers today for the to a warehouse that belongs to the NYPD. And they've been collecting relief goods for Haiti and so far have collected over 200 uh, pallets of food items and, cloth and clothing items and water. And we're gonna be receiving those goods, putting them on a vessel uh, in the next week, sending them to Haiti. And we'll continue doing that as part of our relief efforts for Haiti. Uh, but that is again happening because of you know this first load of pineapples that we decided to, to donate and it's sort of mushroom from there. And it's, and it's having these close community connections. I, I heard the term social, uh, social capital. Well, we've developed that now and we're going to look to leverage that as much as we can in the future for whatever it may be. And hopefully we don't have to deal with any more flooding or, or anything else of that nature. Or certainly we hope the pandemic is going to uh, stop soon and disappear and be be in the rearview mirror. But for as long as it's here and for whatever we can do to help, you know, the folks in the community that, you know, many of our employees live in, uh, we want to continue to do that and be a part of uh, whatever solutions that we can. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Michelle to talk about what Fifth Avenue Committee does and um, how you got involved. Sure, thanks. Um, thanks to both Sam and Erica um, for the invitation. And of course, um, a, a real big thank you to Mike and his team at the Container Terminal for all that they have done um, for the local communities. Um, so as Sam and Erica said, my name is Michelle Delalus. I'm, I'm the executive director of the Fifth Avenue Committee and Fifth Avenue Committee has been around for 43 years. We're a, a nonprofit comprehensive community development corporation. We're based in Gowanus um, and we, we serve low and moderate income people citywide, but our primary catchment area is really um, South Brooklyn, you know, community boards, six, seven, eight to, um, uh, the, the old definition of South Brooklyn rather than kind of like what it looks like on the map. Um, uh, you know, Fifth Avenue Committee has, has been involved with a number of disasters. So um, we, we do a number of things. We, we serve um, uh, normally, we serve about uh, 5,500 low and moderate income New Yorkers every year through a range of programs. Um, <laughs> thanks, Erica. Um, and uh, in, including, you know, we, we build and manage affordable housing. So we have, um, you know, 44 properties where we have nearly 500 low and moderate income families um, living in them. Um, but we also uh, serve folks, um, uh, a lot of folks um, in public housing through adult education, workforce development programs, benefits, access. Um, and so uh, we're, not, we're not new to uh, helping the local community respond to disasters, whether that was after 9-11, um, after Superstorm Sandy, and, and uh, certainly um, during COVID. And so um, we were you know, very, very fortunate to be uh, connected to Mike and his team um, through uh, Ben Margolis, as he mentioned, the former executive director of the Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. And I might add another like network of groups, um, you know, a friendly amendment, if you will, to OER's list. You know, there's co-ads, there's bids, 
There's also IBZs, industrial business zones. Um, and they're also throughout the city. Um, and Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation um, runs the IBZ in Red Hook, Gowanus and Sunset Park. Um, and as Mike said, um, although the working waterfront in Red Hook, Gowanus and Sunset Park um, is, you know, continues to be a working waterfront, thankfully, um, it's surrounded by residential uses. Um, and obviously in Red Hook and Gowanus, that's a, a lot of public housing, but it's also, you know, a, a lot of other folks as well. Um, and um, so when, when the call came in or the email came in from, uh, from Ben saying, um, you know, the Red Hook Container Terminal has 10,000 pineapples. Uh, they, they would like some help getting it distributed to the local community. We were like, pineapples, of course. <laughs> you know, we, we need to get it out. Um, you have to remember it was April uh, of 2020. And so this was before the city's Get Food program was up and running. It's when, um, you know, a lot of food pantries um, themselves didn't have access yet. Like basically the, the supply chain had been interrupted as a result of, of COVID. And so there was really like a, a lack of food and a lot of um, places, especially the smaller produce places um, were lacking supply or even had closed. Um, and so we, we jumped on this because we really saw it as an opportunity to, to build a relationship um, with Mike and his team and to also, you know, help address needs that we were seeing with our residents. Because one of the things that we did immediately after COVID struck is um, FAC uh, administered a survey both to our tenants in our buildings, but also to um, local community members that, um, that we serve about what their needs were. And food insecurity was very high on the list, um, you know, as was income insecurity overall. Um, and so we, we don't normally have, um, you know, we help people access SNAP benefits um, and, and things like that, but we don't uh, directly um, have a, a food pantry that we normally administer, but we saw an opportunity to use the network that we have um, to really um, help distribute things. So, um, you know, we, we assigned a staff member, Karen Blondell, um, really this like became her job um, for a short period of time, uh, for several months really in, in working um, to help distribute this and to really get it into the right hands. Um, and, that, and that involved, you know, um, contact with uh, local public housing leaders um, that involved, you know, uh, coordinating, uh, you know, pickups uh, with various folks, including um, you know, food pantries and mutual aid organizations, uh, you know, the logistics of this is, is no, it's no small thing, uh, is all I can say. Uh, you know, we, we take it for granted that, you know, food kind of like appears in stores and things like that. But when that network is disrupted and you become that network, um, you, you like develop a deeper appreciation for, um, for how it works. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's exactly what we did. And if you want to just kind of scroll through some of the, the pictures a bit um, here, this, this kind of gives you, so this is, this is you know, this is Angel Rodriguez, um, FACS uh, Director of um, Maintenance, um, you know, and he, he, he likes playing the bad guy kind of a thing, but he's been with us nearly uh, 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, we had to go and pick things up at times um, from the terminal. We had to like pull together uh, volunteers and staff to do that if you want to keep scrolling. Um, and, you know, this is a distribution um, at one of the local uh, NYCHA developments, um, you know, again, connecting with the local leaders, making sure they had the resources that they need to take this incredible produce, um, you know, really fresh produce and, um, you know, make sure they had the bags of the volunteers. This again, this is at the height of COVID um, that, you know, finding people who were, who were willing to do that, you know, making sure we had all the appropriate precautions. Like those are the things that, that we took care of. Keep, go ahead and keep scrolling. Uh, I, I took one of the first loads in my car and distributed them to um, a bunch of our properties. It was, I have to say, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it was a lot of fun, like, you know, dropping things off. People love pineapple and it's amazing that, you know, although it's more reasonably priced than it was previously, it, a lot of times for whatever reason, people aren't buying it for themselves, especially low and moderate income people. And so it was 
it was also a way to kind of connect with people culturally. And we did a whole social media piece and people were like adding recipes online for their coconut recipe, I'm sorry, their uh, pineapple recipes and, and things like that. So that was fun. Um, you can keep going. Um, again, some of the uh, local leaders and you can, you can get a see, you know, sense of some of the, the produce that was distributed. Um, this, is in, this is in Red Hook um, that helped distribute uh, some of the produce. Um, and then, yeah, 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 this is one of the Sunset Park um, uh, mutual uh, aid organizations. Um, and again, just the coordination involved in getting things to the, to the right people and then making sure they um, getting the word out in a timely manner because, you know, this stuff is, has to be refrigerated or moved quickly, you know, like that's, that's part of the thing. But I, I think um, for, you know, part of the key message I think is, um, you know, FAC has like an ongoing relationship with Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. Like, and we're part of various networks. I put some of that in the chat. Like, you know, like we're, we're not necessarily active on a monthly basis in the, in the um, business improvement districts or in things like that, but we are part of various networks. And so that has meant that during emergencies, um, we both like put the word out about what we're doing, but we also put the word out if we need something like during Sandy, um, we got a generator because we contacted the Park Slope bid. Um, and that was, you know, it, we were able to, you know, have, uh, you know, em emergency um, electricity for one of our, for one of our properties. It was really through these networks that we've been able to address things, both assist and be assisted. Um, and I think the key thing is to um, figure out what your core strength is. Like, obviously our core strength was like having that community network um, to help um, distribute the goods and, and knowing how to get a, um, make sure that it goes to people in need. Um, and so that that's a key piece. And obviously, you know, for Mike and his team, it's all those relationships um, with those distributors. Um, like we, we would never have that kind, those kinds of relationships. Like that, that's not what we do on a daily basis. I think there might be one more picture. Um, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. This is so. This is one of our one of our uh, senior tenants. Um, I mean, again, look look at all the incredible uh, fresh produce um, that was available. Um, and again, a lot of folks were definitely not leaving the house, <laughs> um, especially at this time. This is you know well before vaccination. Um, and uh, you know, people were deeply, deeply appreciative. Um, and, and this was this was just one piece of our response. Um, you know, we also raised and distributed um, three hundred fifty thousand dollars in emergency cash relief, two hundred fifty thousand to over five hundred families, and another hundred thousand to local small businesses. Um, and you know, that's that's all been very very critical as part of this process as well. Um, I think that's the last photo I have. Um, the only other thing I guess I would. Um, you know, say that that you know the, the point about social capital is real, and I and I think you know any any um, community based organization has it. Uh, you know, like we any successful business has it. Um, it. It may not overlap, though. I think that's what it is. Like the 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 circles of influence or whatever may not naturally overlap, and so um, you know sometimes it's you know making sure you you show up to that webinar or to that meeting or you know, or, um, or at least been listed on, you know, some resource page so that, um, and of course now with social media, there, there might be more connections than ever. That's actually not my strength personally. Um, but, uh, but at the very least, um, I, I think, you know, and just being willing to um, ask for help and also being willing to maybe step outside of what you normally do um, for a short period of time. I know that Sometimes nonprofits, understandably, are concerned about mission creep, but especially during disasters, I think we're often called on to do things um, uh, before official response comes. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. That was um, incredibly comprehensive um, and really kind of touched on what we were talking about, of especially the strength of connection in the community. And I like what you said about um, your circles might not overlap, but you have social capital already if you 
are a business or if you are a nonprofit, of course. So um, with that, I wanted to, before, I know Erica and I have questions, but I wanted to see if anyone in the, um, any of our attendees have questions for our panelists. You can either raise your hand or write in the chat if you have any questions. Um, Erica, is there anything um, that stuck out to you in particular? Yeah, I was actually taking so many notes uh, for my main takeaways. I, I like to learn along with the uh, webinar attendees. And one of the things that um, that we all talked about and hit on in different ways, and I think Mike hit on this at the beginning, is that community collaboration is unique to the locale. And I would add that your stakeholders are very unique from neighborhood to neighborhood, and your response activities can be unique. Michelle talked about the need for heating. Um, in other emergencies, there might be a need for power. You know, she mentioned the generator after Sandy. So those impacts and those hazards can happen in different ways. And it's, you know, there's no cookie cutter solution. And communities have to work together to determine what those gaps are. Uh, just like Michelle said, right? What are what are the gaps? What are we missing? How can we, you know, what are the resources that we have, which fits into those core strengths that we kind of keep talking about? Um, and then how can those resources be distributed to the community equitably and, um, and appropriately? And another huge resource that Michelle mentioned is time and attention. They had a, a, a person who was devoted to overseeing these points of contact if you know i'm sure it was a, a whole team effort but you know if you devote a staff person or part of your schedule to this work um you know it will make the logistics and figuring out those uh details a lot smoother if it's one person who is kind of spearheading that effort and i also think that um that amazing little nugget of show up and be present when there are opportunities to connect, um, you know, that doesn't happen in gray skies, as we like to call disaster times at emergency management. Usually those opportunities occur during blue skies, you know, like a, a gorgeous day, like on Monday, for example. And we, um, you know, can be really nice to just, oh, I have some free time. Um, ha ha ha. I know that's not uh, very common, but, um, you know, using that time to develop relationships, meet the folks that are in your neighborhood, in your bid, um, you know, just making that connection so that if, you know, you do decide to move forward with asking for resources, you've already made that, um, made that point of contact and have had that conversation. Um, and I think another thing, <laughs> it just so chock full of information and so helpful to is to ask and repeat, right? Talk to each other about your core strengths and how you can help each other um, and, and ask uh, if, if you need something. Um, the worst thing that can happen is that you aren't able to provide it and you know have to go ask someone else. Um, and I really loved how Mike mentioned um, that when they have all of this, all of these pineapples to give away, they didn't, um, you know, they didn't start just, they didn't pop up on the corner and start handing out pineapples. They said, oh, what relations do we already have? Um, you know, we, we know our collectives, we have a coalition or we have, we're part of a bid. Um, let's start there and see who we can um, connect with to make sure that this distribution makes sense for the community. Um, so I know that was like 10 different things, but I thought all of them were so helpful. Hey, thanks, Erica. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but please do if you have any. The um, the one thing I wanted to ask was just now that you've made now that you've done it once, where do you see? Um, I guess where do you see the future now that you have made that connection? What do you think it allows you to do in the future? I would, um, Mike, if you want to take that first. Yeah, sure. So, you know, like like today where we're handling relief goods for Haiti in the future, I don't have to wonder who I'm going to call or, or what resources are out there and available to for us to work with and work and, and for 
you know, I'm going to call Michelle or I'm going to call other folks that we now connected with uh, that have a direct link to the community more so than we do. So if we do have another scenario or another situation where we want to do something and, and have the community involved, it's much easier uh, to do that. And, and there's a path forward and that connection is already made. And I think that's really the key, you know, thing to worry about going forward is it's not a question of if there will be another you know, disaster or some or disaster or some other issue requiring community assistance. It's when, and the more we're connected to the community and to the right uh, individuals within the community that can, you know, provide and lend that assistance to make those connections and help us with the resources that we have uh, and, and a shared resource with, with the community, the, the better off we're going to be and the more prepared we're going to be uh, in the future. Great, and I, uh, the same question for you, Michelle. What, um, I guess, what has this experience um, made you think about the future? Um, I, I think the the main thing um, is that you know, obviously, New York City has such incredible uh, diversity of organizations and businesses, and there's just so many opportunities for us to to partner with one another. I mean, you know. I know Mike also is, for instance, involved um, in the the wind power initiative at the um, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal. There's going to be jobs there in the future. Some of those same people. You Hello, know. everyone, and welcome to the environment. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was uh, finding a link to Karen Blondell presenting, and I'm going to put it in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so like, I, I know when we're further along in that process and there's gonna be jobs available, like, you know, I know he has in the back of his mind, the local people he's gonna to wanna to, um, recruit. And, you know, I certainly have in the back of my mind, um, the local people we wanna help get jobs. Um, you know, so that's, so that's one thing that I think about. I think about, um, you know, projects where we're gonna be building housing and there's gonna be public open space and. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice to, um, you know, have some kind of um, ongoing, uh, uh, you know, uh, food availability for the, for the local community, all of, all of those things. Um, and, you know, in general, I think it's also just helpful for people to like, people who live next to industrial uses to know that those industrial uses are beneficial to the city as a whole. Um, and like, and, and serve a purpose. And it's not just about like, you know, the trucks, it's also about the jobs and about the incredible goods and services that they, that they provided the city. Like, I, I think about all those things. <laughs> Great, thank you both. And thank you both again for presenting. Um, again, we will send out the recording and all of the links, but thank you so much for being here and for your partnership. The last thing we wanted to touch on before we do close out is that it is still National Preparedness Month and we have a series of events that we are holding in addition to our emergency response work. Some of these have passed, but um, coming up is in Staten Island, the Children's Museum is free on September 26th and we'll have lots of activities for families and to learn about preparedness. And then finally, we have our Older Adults Ready Fest. Um, so any seniors who are interested can come um, to our event in the Bronx. And then in terms of our webinar series, we have recordings to these and they will be available at nyc.gov slash NPM. But coming up, we have how to meet the moment during emergencies, three steps to organizational preparedness. We have a community mapping, so how you can figure out what assets are in your community so you can do the work that we're describing today. And then finally, disability access and functional needs training, and that will teach you how to work with people with disabilities in your community. Finally, again, we are responding to Ida, and if you need resources, including for small businesses or nonprofits, you can go to nyc.gov slash Ida. Um, Thank you everyone for coming and um, I hope you have a great week.